Hey, everybody. Welcome to the second installment of the diffusion model reading group for molecular modeling. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, EM 2023. Uh, Nick's going to do a brief introduction, and then we're going to have a discussion about it. So take it away, Nick. All right. Okay, can you see the slides? Yeah. Perfect. All right, so um, welcome again. Like Matt said, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction um, to Frame Diff, which is this paper by Yim et al, 2023. Um, it's a model based on SE3 diffusion, so we're gonna get into the, some of the basics of that. Um, but before that, um, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to um, a, a little overview of the, the meeting group again, um, logistics schedule and future topics again, um, and then we'll dive into the paper background context. Um, and then we're going to get into the figures and results. This is going to be the really discussion portion where we dive into the paper. Um, and we really get to talk to each to each other and see what um, and make sense of this very math heavy paper. Um, and then we'll go through some conclusions. So just very briefly, the logistics. Um, once again, we're meeting every two weeks. The next meeting is going to be in October, October 11th. Um, there's a Google form, so if you have your phone and you want to do this now, there's, this will also appear later, um, but there's a Google form to select the next paper. Um, there's just a couple options. Um, these are some of the, the different options. There's ARC Diffusion and a bunch of other different protein models, except, including some very recent ones, such as ProPartal and um, EvoDiff. So um, feel free when you get a chance to look at this um, form and fill this out before next meeting so we can um, really try to decide on what's coming next. So um, I just wanted to give another brief overview of what diffusion was. This kind of recaps what we talked about last week. Um, so in general, the idea is we have a forward diffusion process that adds noise to an image iteratively. And eventually it'll come down to a uniform prior distribution um, or some sort of random prior distribution. Um, the reverse direction is what's actually being learned. So this is where the neural network comes in um, and it learns to iteratively denoise each of these images. So we iteratively remove noise. Um, I'm gonna add some math to this now. Um, so we say this first data image is at time zero. Um, and we say that this image X um, is at time zero from the data distribution and it has a height and width um, corresponding to the number of pixels in each of those dimensions. Um, at the end, at time capital T, we have some sort of prior distribution. I'm going to call this pi. Um, and once again, they're still just sampling an image from that, still height and width um, dimensions, um, but it's some sort of random prior. Um, and in this case, um, this is actually going to be a uniform, uh, uh, sorry, a Gaussian or a normal prior with mean zero and some sort of um, um, standard uh, variance. Um, but so this is for Gaussian. Um, and if you notice each of these images are actually a real number. So this is what R and if we define N to be just the number of pixels in the height dimension times the number of pixels in the width dimension, we have N um, different pixels total. So we say that this image lives in Rn, which is um, gonna be the space we're diffusing over. Um, so I know that's a little bit um, heavy, but um, let's talk about the, that sampling procedure for Gaussian diffusion. Um, and this is what we talked about last week uh, or two weeks ago, but I'm just going to reiterate these. So this is also called inference. Um, so the first step of this inference is to sample from this uniform or from this prior. We have our normal distribution that we're just sampling from. This is a multivariate normal. Um, and then we pr predict some noise with our um, um, neural network. So this is how much noise we think the model thinks was added to our image. We take a step to remove this noise and then eventually we get some sort of denoised image. We repeat this for a number of time steps. Um, this is usually pretty large, um, but um, some of the early works were like a thousand. So this takes some time, um, but eventually we get down to X zero, which should be something that looks like our data distribution. So. This is all in good, but this was really set up for images um, and for this normal prior distribution. But how do we really do diffusion on protein backbones? Um, so just a reminder what a protein backbone looks like. This is the cartoon representation. But if we look at all the atoms 
Um, so we notice that there's a bunch of um, different atom types connected to each other, um, forming this protein backbone. Um, and there's a very re repeating structure within each residue. Um, you can kind of see that structure here. Um, but they're all connected and they form this protein backbone. Um, I'm gonna kind of abuse a little bit of notation and say that this is X zero again. Um, so consider this protein X zero from a data distribution. Um, we actually can say that this is um, a shape of number of atoms by three. So each of the atoms gets three points in X, Y, and Z coordinate. And there are a certain number of these. So that's just what kind of dimension this X is. Um, we can say that this X lives in the real numbers of um, size in atoms by three. Um, so this is a huge space, um, but this is where this protein backbone lives if we parameterize it um, by all atoms. But um, if we do it this way, we can actually use this Gaussian diffusion that we kind of defined previously. Um, but there are some limitations to this. Um, the biggest one really being we have unphysical bond lengths and angles. Um, so just kind of visualize this. Um, if we're doing uniform or this um, Gaussian diffusion, each of these atoms can move independently. And so you can really violate some of the physical um, characteristics of these bonds. So this bond, for example, may be really far apart. Um, it can also violate some angles and stuff like that. Um, so this is a totally viable option. And we have seen some papers recently coming out doing all atom diffusion kind of with um, this kind of framework with the Gaussian noise. Um, and we might talk about that later in one of the future sessions, but um, this is not the approach that frame diff used. Um, so let's kind of build up the, the foundation for um, going from R diffusion, so from these real numbers, to SE3 diffusion. Um, so like I said, each of these residues in the protein has this repeating structure. So we have a nitrogen atom connected to a carbon, connected to another carbon connected to an oxygen. So this is the repeating structure of a single residue in the protein. So there are a certain number of these throughout the entire protein. Um, we can define a rotation matrix. So this is what R is by following this Graham-Schmidt orthogonalization process um, using these vectors going from C alpha to N and C alpha to C. Um, we can also assign a um, coordinate located at the C alpha. Um, so in the end, we have an actual object in SE3. So what SE3 is, is a transformation, a rigid transformation in Euclidean space. Um, and it's defined by a rotation matrix. So this is the rotation that kind of gives the orientation of this residue, as well as where the residue is, which is governed by this X parameter here, this translation. Um, there's also this psi angle that really places the oxygen, but we're not gonna really worry about that right now. Um, that's kind of just predicted by the model. So like I said, we have a transformation in SE3. This is also gonna be referred to as a frame. So I'm gonna use that um, interchangeably throughout um, this talk, um, but um, like I said, it, you kind of break SE3 into two main components. There's a rotation component and a translation component. This rotation component is actually an element of SO3, which is another group that um, just governs all the different rotations you can do in 3D space. Um, and R will be just a, there's a couple different representations, but um, predominantly we can use a three by three matrix that just represents the rotation in 3D space. Um, translation wise, this is just kind of something we've kind of seen before. This is just a point in R3. Um, so this is just a vector with three components in R3. Um, so when we combine these, we actually have a rigid frame in 3D space. So to kind of visualize that, this is what our protein looks like if we look at all the atoms. Um, we have our nice backbone structure, the repeating elements. Um, if we look at this frame-wise, notice here, we have all the frames for each residue um, and they're connected this, this gray line um, connects them in sequence. So they're kind of by adjacent um, residues, but each residue has a frame in 3D space. Um, and this frame is SE3. Um, and there are a certain number of residues. Um, so each residue gets a certain frame. So we can actually view a protein as a collection of frames rather than a collection of atoms. So this has some benefits. Um, Notably, uh, reduced degrees of freedom. So there's a lot less degrees of freedom. Um, we're not going to be violating the intra-atom, um, intra-residue 
degrees of freedom. So we'll have ideal bond lengths and angles when we're inside a single residue. So we use ideal bond lengths for C alpha to C, C alpha to N, um, as well as this oxygen. And um, yeah, so there's ideal bond lengths and angles, which is nice. But the only main downside is we're kind of violating um, the peptide bond geometry. So how each of these residues connect to each other, that isn't really controlled. Um, and so you might be able to see some violations there. But hopefully the model can learn um, to not really create these violations. Um, and so this representation is actually something that's not new. Um, this has been used before in like AlphaFold. Um, this is exactly how AlphaFold mod models its proteins and it moves these proteins around or each of these residues around rigidly um, using these frames. Um, yeah, so this isn't a new idea, um, but applying diffusion to it is relatively new. Um, so let's do SE3 diffusion. So like I said, we have a protein that's a bunch of rigid frames connected to each other. Um, we have our protein X0, um, and it's an element of SE3 to the number of residues. Um, and each element of SE3, so each residue, is a transform. And that transform is made up of a rotation, which is a three by three rotation matrix, and a translation, which is a just a vector. So we need to define some sort of forward process. Unfortunately, if we just try to do this over um, the transformations here, these rigid frames, there's not really a canonical diffusion process. So we kind of have to just define our own. Um, and there's some math behind this, but in the end, um, we can separate this out and try to do diffusion over the rotation in the translation. Um, so we can try to do diffusion over SO3, which is all the different rotations, and then the diffusion over R3, which is all the different translations we can have. So we're gonna model diffusion on SO3 and R3 independently. And there's some foundation for this, um, and the paper goes through the math, but um, I'm, for brevity, not gonna do that. Um, and this comes with some interesting ideas. We need to define our priors. So what are we going to sample from um, initially to get our super noisy protein and eventually denoise that? So we're going to use a uniform distribution over SO3 and just a normal distribution um, in 3D space. So what this uniform distribution looks like, this is just saying any rotation in 3D space you have is equally probable. Um, so there's any chance you can have a rotation um, in any direction, um, and you can have a point kind of governed by this normal distribution, which is something we've really seen before. Um, okay, so I think this is kind of a very high level overview of what we needed to kind of build up the context and background for this paper. Um, so before like we start looking at the actual paper itself, um, are there any questions about kind of this SE3 diffusion process or um, the different representations of proteins, maybe. Okay, great. Let's um, maybe pull up the paper and we'll um, start talking about it. Cool. All right. Um... All right, can you see this? Maybe you can zoom in. Yeah. All right. So I assume you can see the paper? Yes. Perfect. All right. So this is the paper, um, SE3 diffusion for protein backbone generation. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, let's go through the figures first, I assume. Um, Yeah, so this is figure one. Um, this kind of shows the overview. I've talked about this briefly, um, but does anybody want to try to summarize maybe what's happening in figure A, um, 1A? I briefly talked about this, but um, maybe somebody can try to reverbalize what I said um, in different language, maybe. <laughs> I can give it a shot. Um, 
So I think this is just showing how the a given frame is being parameterized in terms of the different like matrix values. So X is just uh, defining that the C alpha, the, the position of the C alpha in 3D space. And then I think relative to that, all of the, the, the nitrogen and the carbon get placed according to, I don't know what Graham Schmidt means, but I'm assuming that's like the idealized bond lengths and stuff. And then the T is the translation matrix or the, the rotational matrix for, I guess, for the whole frame. And then the, that's a phi is the, um, describing the, the torsion angle for this, for the, the oxygen. And I, one question I had with this is why, why does the oxygen have to get treated separately and why you can't use I, like an idealized bond length, I guess, I guess you don't know the, the angle that it, is that relative to the rest of the residue? Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you were pretty accurate for most of everything, but I'm just going to kind of um, refine a little bit of what you said. Um, so this Graham Schmidt um, is a, just a proto, like an algorithm that you can follow to um, construct a rotation matrix. So this is what we use to actually construct the rotation matrix around C alpha. So this gives us the orientation of the residue, kind of where it's facing in 3D space. Um, like you said, yeah, X is exactly right, the C alpha, where the residue is in 3D space. So these make up our transformation. So we know where the residue is, as well as what the orientation of, of that residue is. Um, and yeah, so this last angle is really just the psi angle. Um, it just really governs where the oxygen is placed. And you're right, we, um, we are using idealized bond lengths here and angles. Um, but the problem is we don't really know where this torsion angle is or where to place this oxygen off of the C. Um, and that's just something that they're going to predict in the end. Um, but you can totally imagine just, um, you can also imagine diffusing over SO2 to get oxygen placed, but um, they don't do that here just for simplicity, I assume. Um, yeah, that was, that was a great, um, thank you a lot, Henry, for um, taking a stab at that. Um, are there any questions on like what figure A represents? Uh, I have a question on how from just predicting one dihedral, you can go into the protein backbone because how do you ensure that the omega is flat? Uh, so when, you, when you're bringing these individual residues together, just from the prediction of one dihedral, how do you end up predicting? Like, is it, are they showing that this is how one of the dihedrals is predicted and the other ones are also predicted like this? Yeah, so um, we're actually predicting a couple of different things for every residue. So we're predicting the rotation and the translation. So essentially where that residue is in 3D space and the orientation of that as well as the angle to place the oxygen off of this. So we're actually predicting where the residue is in 3D space. But like you mentioned, this doesn't really control what the peptide bond looks like. Um, so because we're actually handling each of these independently, um, you can see in this very noisy protein here that we're actually violating a lot of the peptide bond geometry. So there's no real um, control over what omega is, which is that, um, the uh, torsion around to this bond here. Um, but there, yeah, so we, there's no real control over that. And hopefully the model just learns to place them in a very realistic manner, um, but we're not actually kind of controlling that. So that, that is one downside of this diffusion process. That kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. I guess one question I have is if you have two frames that go from like, residue i to residue i plus one, does that control where the position of the oxygen is because of the peptide bond that comes out of it? Or is that still yeah. a degree of freedom? So um, that is kind of, so what's happening is the model predicts um, what this angle is after it's placed the, um, so 
we have this will be a little bit more clear once we have like a little schematic of what um the network kind of looks like but in the end for each residue we kind of have some sort of latent representation of what that residue looks like or where it should be and from that we predict what the residue's orientation and translation are so where that residue is in 3d space and then we also predict where that oxygen is so it kind of knows what's around it what it's connected to and it predicts where that residue is and where the oxygen is. So it kind of places that entire residue. Does the oxygen need to be predicted, though? If you know the C alpha, the C, and then the next N, you can compute the oxygen, right? With idealized coordinates. With, if you had, or with idealized oxygen coordinates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, maybe they just don't want to idealize it. Maybe that's mm -hmm. yeah. You, you can't define the dihedral without the oxygen. You need the oxygen there to define the dihedral. No. That, that, I mean, that, other, because conventionally we define it with the next, uh, like when we do protein geometry, conventionally we'll define it with the next nitrogen. But here there is no next nitrogen if you're looking at them individually. Yeah, but like so once you have the dihedral, all the you frames, need... right? You have, you have all the N residues, then you can place the oxygens by just looking at the some of the atoms from the frame of one and the, some of the atoms of the frame of the next one. My understanding was that the parameterization is done on a per residue basis. And on a per residue basis, you cannot define psi if you don't include the oxygen. Well, Nick, if you if you say it makes more sense later, then we can maybe come back to it. Um, I'm yeah. actually... So I'm not sure it will make more sense, like just based on this discussion, but um, I so I think that's a very interesting point. I guess I don't know how um, you would place oxygen if you just have the two neighboring frames. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, I, I can try drawing. Like if you have the next, um, you know, this is N C alpha C, and then you have the N bond. This is now part of the next frame, right? Yeah. Um, so once you have the two frames, then this uh, direction here is defined based off of uh, this coordinate, this coordinate, and this coordinate, which you'll get once you get once you've placed all the frames in space. And so mm. you can figure out what the coordinate is for the oxygen by. Um, in I'm looking at supplemental I1, they have kind of a formula for this atom to frame. Um, and I think you can just, if you assume idealized beyond geometry, then getting the position of the oxygen is um, like for free. I mean, it's maybe, maybe you don't want to assume idealized geometry, but the I don't think there's a, an extra degree of freedom here once you've already placed the position of this here. Maybe I'm mistaken and I'm and, and not thinking about this correctly. No, I, I'm with you. So I guess um, this this carbon is what, S, sp2 hybridized? Um, no, it's so, a... Oh, yeah. yeah. There's um, a... This geometry would be flat, right? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, should be planar these four atoms. Yeah, so I don't see why you couldn't just place the oxygen based on the next frame. They don't spend a lot of time worrying about this this angle here. So maybe we can also not worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not, yeah, maybe we'll figure out exactly how it's being done. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting point though. I just wanna maybe having the oxygen there helps with like learning where to put the next nitrogen. Like it, it could probably learn that it should be a flat geometry without the oxygen, but maybe having that additional atom there helps it orient or something. My impression of the idea is that they have, like you have these different, um, like you're just parameterizing the whole thing as a set of frames and transformation over the set of frames. So it, the only degrees of freedom are the are these SE three coordinates for the T's, um, and that is enough because that positions 
the frames relative to each other all the way along the way. I, I do like that hypothesis, though. Um, the one thing I think that kind of discredits that hypothesis is that um, when we looked at the actual features of the network, it doesn't actually take into account anything besides the frame and kind of the relative sequence separation. So it doesn't even know where the oxygen is at, um, at intermediate time steps. So I think it would be really cool to kind of incorporate that in yeah. one of the features. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think it actually uses where the oxygen is at kind of these intermediate time steps. It's kind of just predicted. Um... OK, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll scooch down and see what we, what we see. All right. Um, where do you want to go? Sorry. Let's, let's just scroll down and we'll see uh, what, what's next. So we talked about the backbone parameterization. I think we talked about this. Uh, so maybe the next piece is on the diffusion modeling. Yeah. Um, so are you talking about like this forward process? No, just down on the right. That section diffusion yeah. on manifolds. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there, there's, sorry. Does anybody want to try explaining what, what this section is about? Please speak up. We're, we're going to try to make this more interactive. So even if you don't understand what's going on, give it a shot. Yeah. Okay. So in this section, I think they were trying to define a way to get the noise frames from uh, previous frames. So starting with their uh, original frames, uh, they wanted to find, they wanted to define the forward process of noise in those frames to uh, the prior distributions. And it's, it's, it's uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure why they did it in terms of like D, X of T, uh, instead of like just the, noise of version. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good yeah, the idea of what, what the here. equation here is that we're like, what is this? Yeah, so I can jump in. Um, so Let's this people equation... can somebody else. So I know I know it's attempting everybody's reading as fast as they possibly can, but like somebody start reading it out loud to try to make it work. We want to somebody else. We know you can do this, Nick, but we want to see. Wait, what did you ask? What what is this equation here, number two? Gradient of something plus Brownian motion. What? So what, what is it defining? Kind of walk through what each of the variables are. Maybe that'll help. I don't see where U is defined. Is that a math? Is that a math symbol that doesn't need definition? <laughs> is it the uniform distribution? I don't know. 
I don't think so. I, I think it's defined in like the next paragraph on the next page. Yeah. They don't really define it, they just say it's a gradient. I think it's just referring to some sort of potential, um, but. So I guess, what is X of T? So X of T is the distribution of the data at time step T. Right. So this is some noisy protein distribution, yeah. And because of this D, we're kind of showing, asking how it's changing with time. Um, and so there's kind of this term here. Um, I guess, what does anybody really know what this is trying to convey? This P inv is the invariant density with respect to this. And this should look kind of like an energy potential. So the energy, the gradient of the energy is often called like a force, right? So this is the, this is like how that, the force on the, um, on the coordinates it's changing with respect to the basically how the energy is driving driving it down. Um, this one half kind of looks like a Gaussian, like in the fact that you would have a one half out here, maybe. There's some discussion about that one half later. But we basically have like it's evolving with respect to this energy, the forces due to this energy, and then this other term here. And this other term here they talk about in the next section. Yeah, so this is kind of driving this distribution of x of t's to kind of look like this in the end. This is really driving how we go from the, the data distribution of x0 to x of t. Um, yeah, so this b is the Brownian motion. Um, and this kind of really governs the forward process. So this adds the noise to our data. Um, this next proposition talks about the reverse process. Um, and yeah. Um, so I guess these are talking about what these gradients look like on the manifold space. This is a super, this is just very mathy, um, but um, this. With Let's see if we can build any intuition around what what like a tangent space is. So you may have any have you seen, seen tangents in other like lower dimensional contexts that may make more sense? Is anybody taking calculus? Yeah. Rudy Parna, I know you've taken calculus. Tangent can be a measure of gradient. Yeah, can you say more? Um, like if you had a like a one D curve and you had a point, what would the tangent space look like at that point? So it's like the, the 
Yeah, tangent at that point. Yeah, so it's like a linear space. So it's an affine, like some transformation of a linear space that is tangent to the point at that location. Mm -hmm. So like if you have some crazy manifold, like a donut or something, right? There's going to be a point and there's going to be some like Euclidean manifold that's hanging out, touching that point at that particular point in, on that manifold. So there's a tangent space for each X. And as you move around the manifold, that tangent space is going to kind of move to as you go close, you know, as you move, move it around. So what does it mean when you have like a gradient that takes values in the tangent of the manifold? So you're sitting here and there's like some force that's pushing you along and it's going to push you kind of like, you know, in the plane that is tangent to the point that you're moving along. It's going to, like you're on a roller coaster, right? You're zooming along mm -hmm. different ways. Mm -hmm. And that, like, that manifold is defined by that invariant density function from, from up above, that like E of negative U. Yeah, so there's this gradient of this invariant, and then there's um, some probability at time t. Uh, this is like the probability, the log probability. So now you're back in energies, and now we're like the gradient of the energies. So this is like a force again. The, the reason why we look at tangents is that when you want to figure out how things move, it's this inner product. So an inner product gives you a way of, of like, at least in very simple spaces, it's going to, you're going to have a certain thing and then you kind of um, apply it like a transformation on it. And that tells you like, let's say you have a, a, like a vector and you do the inner product with something else with a different vector that's going to get like the projection of that thing onto that onto that vector. So there's this inner product on the manifold and that's somehow needs to be defined in order to figure out how things are gonna move um, you know, the, over time. There's this like Laprosse Beltrami operator and this like equation. I think this is all has to do with stochastic differential equations. Um, in the absence of drift. So I think there's different ways you can define SDEs. But I think that one that we had upstairs was a type of, of stochastic differential equation. So this is the um, Brownian motion, and this is sort of how it's defined as as a an operator on a density, so it's going to give you kind of a a small change in the density with respect to this operator, whatever that is. I feel like we're we're all kind of ill equipped to actually understand this, given our like collective lack of math, but maybe if anybody has any other intuition about what's going on here, like this would be a, a great time to jump in. <laughs> I think that uh, you, they can't 
show like it's not a conventional derivative. That's why they need to invoke this notation. Because when you're taking a tangent on a Riemannian manifold, and I think the manifold is what you're defining by this e to the power minus ux. This defines the shape on which they're trying to, you know, like the underlying architecture of the space. So I, I just think that they have to define it in this way because there is no conventional way to write down a derivative on, on that space. So, I mean, the, the, the intuition is exactly what you said. Like you just see in on in that space in which they're moving, how much they move, like what the Delta is, plus you add some noise. The noise in this case is what they're calling the Brownian, uh, like the Brownian motion in that manifold. So this is just adding noise, like taking small movements and adding noise. I, I don't know if there's anything more there. Yeah, I think it's just adding some notation and giving some context for it. So uh, Nick, you introduced this um, like notion of denoising uh, from last week, last time, and also earlier. How does that relate to this like denoising score matching um, as sort of a separate loss from, from what you were describing before? Yeah. Um... So I was kind of, I think in my, my previous um, notation, I was kind of talking about how um, we predict the noise that was added at a certain time step. And then we try to remove that um, as in doing like the sampling process. Um, so this is very related to what is happening here. Um, so the only, the main difference is we're, instead of predicting some sort of noise, we actually have some sort of score. And what the, really the score is, is a gradient. So this is a direction that we want to move in. Um, so you can imagine this as how much noise was added, um, but we want to remove that. So we need to know which direction to actually go in. Um, so what we're predicting is the direction we need to move. Um, and we can compare that to what the ground truth um, noise is or what the ground truth gradient or the direction we need to actually move in. So we predict something with our score network. So this is our neural network that's predicting um, the score or the direction we want to move at time t given our noisy structure. And then we compare that to the ground truth. And this is how we define our loss function. So this is the denoising score matching. So what we're trying to do is match the scores. So the score, like I said, is the direction we want to move. So we want to move in the same direction as the, the true direction is. Um, and this can be viewed as denoising, which is kind of how um, this connects to what I talked about before. Hopefully that made some sense. Do we have any intuition of what this shape is? Like when it says a Riemannian manifold, but that could be literally any round shape, you know? If we can just understand what this shape is, I think it would make a lot, the equations would make a lot more sense. Right now, I just don't understand what the shape of the the underlying manifold is, or like even how to visualize it. Is there any way to visualize the shape? Yeah, it's, so it's this product space of the, of the SO3, which is the, um, uh, the orientation in 3D on the, on the 2D sphere, like you know, on the on the surface of a globe, hmm. as a product with the um, with R three, which is like the location in space. So it's the the frame geometry for each residue, and then there's n of those. So it's this, um, you know, just writing down the coordinates. It's the 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 degrees of freedom to locate yourself on the sphere and then where you are in space and times. So that's the manifold that we're talking about here is this um, manifold of frames. They're doing it in a more general setting of, of like just a general Riemannian manifold. And they have an aside in the SI on other nice manifolds that you might want to look at. Um, you could look at like, like lines in space, which are, um, uh, you know, uh, have a different set of symmetries associated with them that is often comes up in like um particle like um 
uh, like um, high energy physics and things like that. So SU3, I think, SU2. Um, so they're they're doing it in a more general thing and they're gonna like very quickly specialize back down to this like very concrete manifold that they're talking about for um, for the frames. Yeah, I, I'm gonna try to rephrase that because I, I want to share how I think about what this manifold looks like. Um, so I like to think about it on an individual residue basis um, just because there's gonna be N residues and that's some hyperdimensional thing um, and I can't visualize that. So on a single residue, um, we have the rotation matrices. Um, and there are a couple different ways you can actually represent rotations. You can represent them as like the, the rotation vector um, or like quaternions or et cetera. Um, but I like to think of it actually as the rotation vector. So this is gonna be the axis around which we're rotating. Um, and so what I visualize is I think of a sphere in 3D space. Um, so this is gonna represent um, the manifold of SO2. Um, so this sphere in 3D space, just think of it as a ball. Um, and we have a point on that sphere. And that point is the direction at which um, the we're going to be rotating. So that's going to be the rotation axis, the axis around which we're rotating. Um, so think of it as you're placing somewhere on the sphere, which is going to govern the rotation axis, which governs the rotation matrix. And then we also have some point in 3D space, which is just um, yeah, that, that's a lot easier to visualize. So we have some point in 3D space as well as what direction that point is kind of facing. Um, so at least that's that's kind of how I visualize it. Um, I don't know if that helped anybody, but um, yeah. So when we take a derivative of on this sort of a space, what does the derivative look like? I think that's what the... Uh, so, so if you have a space where you're looking at the rotation and translation, what does a derivative mean in this sense? I mean, normally when we're looking at R n spaces, we can think of a derivative as being R n minus n, like in something in that space. So, what does a derivative in this sort of a space even look like? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and it kind of comes back to this inner product idea. Um, so, we have the tangent space. Um, once again, so they do a lot of math, but in the end, they actually consider these two um, these two distributions independently. So we can think of moving on the, the R3 dimension independently versus the, the SO2, SO3 dimension. Um, so on the SO3, so we had the sphere, um, we can just define that tangent plane. So if like you, you take a, uh, a ball, and you lay a flat piece of cardboard on top. That's kind of your tangent space for your SO, um, SO2, SO3, sorry. And then you want, you can move around in the direction on that um, on that cardboard, and that would kind of you bend it to, to make it go fall onto the ball itself. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like on the SO2, SO3 um, manifold. And then you can deal with the the R3 kind of in the usual manner. Um, but yeah, that they so it really depends because, um, so yeah, so I guess it kind of says it here. Um, so there's not really a canonical diffusion on SE three, um, so they have to define one, um, and they really use this definition to govern how they um, actually do the diffusion. Um, so they go through a bunch of things. They define the um, the inner product on SO3, which is that sphere I was talking about. Um, this is a little different. They're, these are actually the rotation matrices, but you can still kind of visualize it as that sphere. Um, this is the inner product on that space. And then this is the inner product um, in R3, um, which is just the standard dot product. Um, yeah, so by doing defining these, you can define your process, your, your forward diffusion process. Um, and they kind of go through that in this next step. Um, but let's let's put a pin on that and um, go through kind of in order. So um, yeah, so we're thinking about this manifold space. Um, and so the, the loss that we're doing, um, this kind of jumps back to what we're doing, removing noise from our, um, our proteins. So we're trying to actually match the score. So this is the direction in which we want to move um, so that it looks like what we want it to look like. So in the forward process, we're actually noising 
our protein. So we move it towards that prior distribution. So uniform over the sphere, as well as um, the Gaussian distribution in R3. Um, so we move it towards that. In the reverse direction, we're going the opposite direction. So we're taking that uniform distribution and mapping it towards a data distribution. This is going to be, look a lot like our proteins, hopefully. Um, so this is kind of what we're doing here. We're taking a score, we're predicting which direction we want to move in, and then comparing it to the ground truth. And then that's going to form our loss for um, the actual denoising process. Um, they have some lay groups, lee groups. Um, not sure exactly how to pronounce that, but um, this defines, they use this to define how their, um, their operation is going to work because they um, make it left invariance. But um, yeah. Before we sort of like blaze through the rest of this, um, we have a few minutes left. Um, maybe we want to jump down to like um, one of their final, just uh, like, you know, let's assume that we can figure out what they're doing based on this math and look at their um, like results or the, you know, something. And then we can decide uh, if we want to try doing this again next time to sort of keep going with it. If we want to like go and do something else and then maybe come back to this um, or, you know, what um, what do people want to do? Is it, has this been productive or is this, um, you know, what would be useful for other people? Yeah. Um... So yeah, let's kind of blaze through some of these. Um, so this is the neural ne network architecture. It's just a graph neural network with some attention. So they use IPA, which is from AlphaFold. They use a transformer. They update the nodes, which represent each residue. They update the connections between them and update the backbones. So they're moving things around in 3D space. We have updated transformations. Um, that's the model itself. They have this algorithm here um, for sampling. Um, but this is the actual kind of results, the meat of it. Um, so what they're really, I guess, okay, um, should I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll talk about this because we're, we're running out of time. So um, the main results are, how do you kind of evaluate your model? So you now have a model that generates backbones. You want to kind of evaluate that and compare it to um, other things. So the main way they do that is with this designability, diversity, and novelty metrics. Um, so de designability is kind of this weird thing that kind of came up recently where um, the idea is you have a, um, I'm actually, um, actually have a slide on this. Um, this is the designability test that they use. Um, can you see the screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is the designability test. So you have your noise. You throw it through frame diff and you get some sort of generated backbone. Um, what they do to test the designability is they throw that backbone through protein and PNN to generate a sequence. They generate a certain number of sequences. I think it's eight they use. Um, then they throw those sequences through ESM bold, which will generate a structure, predict a structure for that sequence. And then they compare that predicted structure to the generated backbone. And what they're testing are a couple of different things. So we have an RMSD comparison. So how does the predicted structure match the, the generated backbone um, as well as the TM? So this is a template matching score. So how well does the, the they match? So this is just a different way of viewing that. Um, so this is the test they're kind of doing and they're trying to figure out how many um, of the generated backbones produce something that has low RMSD to the predicted structure or good TM score. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the overview of um, what that test looks like. Um, and there's there's more details in the PowerPoint, um, and we'll share the slides, so you can feel free to look through those. Um, but they're comparing um, this RMSD comparison. So this is that designability RMSD. So how well does the predicted RMSD, or how well does the predicted structure match the generated structure? And for um, these smaller length proteins, um, frame diff does pretty good. It has very low RMSD from the predicted structure um, to the other one. And we can compare it to RF diffusion um, with pre-training. If you don't add pre-training, so RF diffusion um, has pre-training based on Rosetta Fold, 
which Rosetta Fold predicts the structure of a protein. Um, adding this pre-training helps a lot for RF diffusion, um, but they can see that you can get pretty consistently designable proteins um, of length less than 100 um, using frame diff. Um, and the pretty cool thing is frame diff is a lot smaller and faster than um, RF diffusion. Um, comparing it to PDB, um, so this is the PDB TM score. So how similar are the generated backbones to structures in the PDB itself? Um, we can see that um, they're actually pretty diverse. So I guess usually 0.5 is kind of a novel protein, something that's really not seen much in um, the PDB. But um, we can we generate things that are very similar to what's in the PDB, which makes sense since we're training on those structures anyway. But we do see a little bit of generalization into um, stuff outside of the distribution of the PDB. Um, and here just on uh, this panel C is kind of just an example of that. Um, so we have the this red box here is this top one. So this is a sh rather short protein um, with a pretty good designability score. So this has less than one RMSD, one angstrom RMSD from the ESM fold prediction, which is here in green. Um, and if we compare, line that up with the nearest protein in the PDB, we actually have a template matching score of uh, 0.47. So this is actually pretty dissimilar from anything in the PDB. Um, we can do it with a larger protein here, which is this green dot here, um, or this green box. Um, we have this helical bundle, and we predict it with um, ESM fold, and it can match pretty well. Um, but it also doesn't line up really well with anything actually in the PDB, just over 0.5. Um, so this really highlights the designability, diversity, and the novelty of the generated backbones from RF diffusion, or sorry, uh, frame diff. Um, yeah. Um, so that's kind of like a high level overview of what the results look like. Um, and we're, I think we're out of time now. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks, Nick, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, please give feedback if you think this was useful or how we can make it better. Um, this was a difficult paper, and I hope if you haven't get a chance to read it in depth that maybe this gives you a new chance to go back and look at it and um, you know think more about uh, what they're actually trying to do in the context of it. Um, but yeah, so please join us again in two weeks, and we'll hopefully have a, another exciting paper to discuss.